without wearing. We are we were okay. with the face shield and the middle seat person was Hello. wearing the. Yeah, good evening. Ah, uh, Dr. Rani, good evening. Yeah, good evening. Dr. Rani, how are you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, all right. That's great to see you. All good, sir. Everything is okay. Yes. Good, good, good. Uh, sir, Dr. Rajiv PP is a bit busy. He won't be able to join today. Okay, sir. Okay, okay, no need. Uh, we'll start with chairman address and opening remarks straight away. Dr. Shainik. Yeah, perfect. You can you can just see if you can uh, just uh, upload your presentation and share the screen and you. Yeah, yeah. Just check that. Yeah, just check, sure. check your sharing. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> Dr. Shanning, you will be covering both seminoma and uh, non seminomitis or only? No, I, I, I am told about even in my lecture, everywhere it is written only non seminoma. Uh, no, no, what has happened is last time, na, Dr. Uh, uh, Jinil class was uh, uh, this our uh, converted to RCC. So, okay, no problem. No problem. Okay, I was given, <coughs> so I have prepared right now slides according to that. Okay, no issue. No issue. Otherwise, talk even or I, no I could have added if I would have been. No, no, given. I, I, I don't know what uh, uh, like uh, instructions were given. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, on that day, uh, we had a little postponement of uh, uh, one faculty problem was there. So, Jinil has to be, the class has to be changed. Okay, okay. But we have advertised for non seminometers only. Yes, yeah, exactly. Non Correct. In email also, I got, yes, non seminometers. Okay, true. fine, fine, fine. I thought uh, probably uh, they have given you to cover both the things. <laughs> no, I, I would have not mind that. But I think as what was written, I have, I have tried to stick to that rather than we... Uh, no, that is fine, Shirani. You, That's you fine. Uh, we will split that. into two only uh, because uh, this itself is a, uh, a full subject only. And now I will try to share... Because I'm in an area where the words are not No, 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 no. I should be sure. When I examine Shishpaga, I have the guests from outside. I've been ready to look at them. Uh, so, why the share window is closed? I'm trying again. Is it okay? Can you see the slides? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. So, I am stopped sharing right now. Uh, Dr. Shanik. Yeah, tell me. So, we'll have first your uh, uh, presentation or uh, something like a lecture. And then probably you'll be giving one case 
to for yeah, discussion. Have, yeah, correct. We are ready yeah, with one okay. good case. Okay, excellent. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. excellent. But I must say these are the good activities which are going on and I think something which is always especially from the students perspective wherever in exams wherever we are going things look very different that's been problem. Uh, 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 Dr. Shanik, uh, Dr. Rajiv Sud vision is like this uh, he wants to make these classes as a standard so that people consider these as a benchmark not yes. so the the wants to bring the level to uh, this level uh, that these are the standard and benchmark for all regions to refer I believe we'll start sharp at 8 o'clock, right? Yeah, uh, I think Navneet will remind us. They will give the countdown. We'll start with the opening remarks uh, from Chairman and then over to you then. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Hello. Uh -huh. uh, so can, now I just give a count. Mike, even I am. Okay, sir. Let's have a countdown. Five. Okay. Three, two, one. All yours. Good evening, everybody. Greetings from Indian School of Urology. This is the great time and not only Indian School of Urology, I am sitting in uh, Srinagar. So greetings from Srinagar, Kashmir. So today is the very uh, uh, great day when Dr. Shonik, eminent professor uh, and uh, faculty is going to be with us speaking on Known uh, seminomata, germ cell tumors, testicular tumors. Now, something about these programs. This COVID time has given us an opportunity that we can initiate from Urological Society of India through Indian School of Urology, the uniform curriculum. And this is the webinar which is uh, going to be there. And uh, now National Medical Commission is in position at MBBS level, we have already implemented the competency-based curriculum, and it is our duty of the academic associations that we go for now competency-based curriculum. One um, uh, just explanation that we work on knowledge, and after the demonstrations that uh, show and after that, there is performance. The three levels of competency, which are the first two levels are further divided into two. And uh, this webinar is the part of uh, knowledge. So we have the competencies, know, know how, show, show how, and how to perform. And we have various programs like uh, right from the webinars, then we have mock exams, we have explanation with the experts like, uh, um, Shaniksha today and uh, also after that we have Euromed programs, we have innovations, the last webinar was there and also uh, the future is going to be again the revisiting our cadaveric labs after uh, our wet labs uh, and also our uh, simulation centers. I think, I hope very soon we are going to start that. So today's topic is very important. This is important for examination. This is important for theory paper. It is important for practicals. It is important even the, in the practicals, the table viva, where you are shown the specimens. And not only that, in uh, DNB examination, which is the terminology is recently changed for superspecialty, that is doctorate of uh, national board. 
and in that also this uh, today's uh, webinar is going to be very very important because it can uh, give you very good marks very good result and the understanding which is going to be with us is going to be integrated into your practice your practical knowledge and uh, with this all the wishes from indian school of urology and uh, i will uh, hand it over to dr uh, arun chavla my co host to invite uh, dr shroniksha dr arun chavla please yeah thank you sir uh, and uh, dear residents uh, today we have uh, uh dr shanik shah he is professor and head uh, department of urology at medical college civil and civil hospital ahmedabad um he'll be talking about uh, non seminomatous germ cell tumor uh for you he has prepared a very nice presentation and which should be followed by a, a index uh, case for discussion and without much ado um, i just invite dr shanik shah to take over and start the proceeding over to you sir dr shanik yeah thank you uh thank you very much first of all i would like to appreciate the effort which has been done is the slides are visible it is okay yeah you are good to go please yeah okay so uh, this is a excellent way of probably doing the discussion especially for the residents that we should be touching upon the practical and the same purpose or topic we are talking about today is a non seminomatous germ cell tumors we would be making sure that this may not be just theory probably theory i am sure all of you can read from the textbook and we may not be only talking about the point but what are practical points what are more important points i considered we would be looking at that so if we go straight to the topic see uh, this testicular tumor which is probably the if you would look at how common it is in especially in our country and in usa if you will see that the incidence is around 1 to 2% of all the cancers but when we look at the germ cells tumors they are mainly most common is 95% out of that and especially they may be located in the testes the majority but few may be extra gonadal so what is the real important thing in the germ cells tumor is the introduction of c splitting that has really changed the management earlier the mortality of because normally when we diagnose this cases similar to the like prostate cancer or they are been like painless they are already get metastasized in the body and then when we diagnose and start treating so earlier the the survival was only 10% before the chemotherapy when the cisplatin was introduced but in this day era since almost 1970 the cisplatin mm -hmm. was introduced the uh, the survival has almost become 80 to 90% that's pretty significant now what is the age group see uh, this is you know that there are different age peaks of that if it is a pretty young age then 20 to 40 then above uh, 50 years and these are the different and certain races it is more common in the white race and certain geography in the certain areas this is going to be more common like denmark norway switzerland part of uh, europe mm -hmm. and there you will be seeing it more this is typically where the, it is probably mute the other mics which are oh. not there yeah please few of the like uh, big figure uh, lens i'm strong i'm sure you people would have heard about him like he had a testicular and how he was diagnosed this is part is very important he had a, he uh, had a difficulty in cycling and that is how he was really went for a examination and then he was diagnosed and then again he had a already tumor had spread to everywhere lungs lymph node and then and then he got every chemotherapy and everything and then probably even for the brain even he got operated and then ultimately he's been completely cancer free for many years so again our goal is to if we can probably diagnose the things in time and start treating that is our goal now let's start from the anatomy like how what is most important this is a like testicular tumor but for any uh cancer of urological cancer if i am talking about 
this is one of the most important that we must know completing about the anatomy embryology how it is what are the types of cells from the endoderm ectoderm and the mesoderm how cells are coming out which are the uh, layers from which the multiple how the sperms get put is the seven layers that we should know and similarly for about every malignancy like if even if you are talking about prostate or the kidney cancer which are uh, the bladder cancer we should if we know the basic normal anatomy normal embryology and then if we try to understand the abnormality like pathology and especially now in today's time probably pathology has a lot of lot to say because that is going to decide upon its how it is going to behave any tumor how they are going to behave so like again if we go testes we know that it actually gets descended from the abdomen it goes down right up to the level of the scrotum it may remain un, un, uh, descended or the in a ectopic location and then the chances of undescended or ectopic location again chances of malignancy would increase more and that is something which we are really concerned about that what are the see these are the normal coverings these are important that because we would like to know that as this testicular tumor there it is going to get enlarge or involve we are going to get the, the last part that the person may not have any the loss of testicular sensations will be there and that is something which is important the blood supply we know that uh, both the sides like there are from the testicular artery from the aorta the cremastric and artery to the rectus deferens the venous is very important the pemphiniform plexus we know that this is because we do a lot of varicose surgery maybe for the infertility or maybe and that is how we know this very well and on the each side how vein gets uh, on the left is different it goes to the renal vein and on the right it goes right into the iris now this is most important if we know the anatomy correctly and especially the lymphatic drainage the way how to treat probably would become more easier because our understanding of like from testes normally a tumor would go to the the next level will be once it is going to the retroperitoneum the left and the right pre periaortic intraaortic cavel and that is how these are the different on the right and the left that you will be know that, that these are the area where the metastasis would happen and that should be very important that we should know about the lymphatic drainage now what are the certain predisposing factors like as i already said undescended testes client factor syndrome positive family history somebody in the family has a similar history positive personal somebody has already one side can also at a later date on the other side also he can have the testicular tumor uh, some trauma viral infection at times they may be having the pre existing things and one can probably find it out from there that uh, and one can notice probably that now the pathological classification is how it is been already diagnosed this is intratubular germ cells neoplasia the germ cells tumors are being already classified in the seminoma and the non seminoma seminoma we know that they are classical type and a plastic and spermatocytic while the non seminoma is this is very important that will be getting embryonal carcinoma depending on the cell the teratoma yolk sac tumor choriocarcinoma and mixed germ cells tumors few are from the sex cord stromal tumors uh, like the leydig cell sertoli cell tumors and few others are the lymphoma rebus myosarcoma and melanoma now let's talk about seminoma probably this is a commonest variety and usually the target will be fourth in the fifth decade of that and then probably you will see the typical tension this kind of the cut section that you would have definitely seen in the specimen also many times and these are the like painless testicular mass and majority you will see that like 30% would have the metastasis at the presentations second variety now this again i am going that pathology is the most important thing if we know the pathology what it is would make a big difference because the pathology would have the difference uh because how the tumors are going to behave if i give you one example about the pathology we know that in prostate carcinoma 
like if the glycine 8, 9, 10, then we know that these are going to be more aggressive tumors. These are going to be similarly in RCC. We know that if somebody has a <clears throat> moderate or the uh, the low grade variety, uh, then I think that, that those tumors are going to probably for many years you will have good fall off without any problem. While similarly, <coughs> probably. If somebody, as we had recently had a uh, gentleman who had a like with RCC had a spindle cell variety, and then completely nine months he came back with a metastasis to a whole body. So, giving example here is this is very important. Certain cancers like this embryonal carcinoma, this is second most common, and this is majority is present in the mixed stem cell tumors, and they are again very high. Uh, degree of that AFP, like alpha fetoprotein will be positive, beta HCG will be elevated in few cases. Yolk sac tumor, this is another tumor which is very common and where it is uh, in a young age that you will be able to see that. And this is again the alpha fetoprotein is one of the very important tumor markers which can probably tell us. And uh, this is the most usual is that will be the testing the mass representations. Again, chorea carcinoma, this is one where this probably breaks all the rules. This chorea carcinoma, normal tumors would always go one by one lymphatic spread, the first, second station it will go. This will probably just break all the rules. And this goes straight into the blood. There would be the beta HCG would be elevated and the metastasis straight to lung and brain would be there. Not necessarily like typically these tumors would that you will be able to see that ACV enlargement. And that is why they are difficult to pick up. Another thing I would strongly recommend that all of you should try to probably draw a figure when you see them of the each type of the histopathological figures because that is how you would be able to probably remember the individual variety. The teratoma, this is another very important and because this is the, it's a combination of mix things would be there and this is, they call it a monster tumor. There would be some calcification, some hardness, some softness, and then there would be and the age group and everything would be there. The tumor markers may not necessarily be very high. So now let's talk about, we, for majority, we already talked how they normally go by the lymphatics and their one by one, the stations in the order while only choriocarcinoma or certain tumors would go straight and without really following that. These are the normal route from the scrotal inguinal region first, and then they may probably go to the periaortic, preaortic, and the interaortocule. This that you would be probably be able to see that. And the blood spread, we already said it will go straight to the other organs like liver, lungs, bone, and the brain. Now, how to manage? But before managing, I would say the most important, how to diagnose them. So as a part of clinical examinations, like as on today, I, I considered the importance of routine clinical examinations where you would definitely see anybody with a per abdomen. If you will palpate the per abdomen, you may at times be able to see the liver is palpable or there may be the... Uh, the um, the retropatrial mass is palpable and the most important that you will be able to see the testicular mass which, which you can see that that is also palpable but nothing can probably uh, replace a clinical examination so we must know that the clinical examination is must that is something which is very important and once we do the clinical examination then we should do the necessarily all the tests like on examination, if you are finding the testis is like hard and there is a mass and which is not even, there are no sensations, we need to differentiate it with from the with many different kind of a differential diagnosis. And once the one of the most important modality is that we like to get the ultrasound and not only ultrasound, but also we may get a Doppler done. And then these are the basic tests to probably do the as a part of clinical evaluations, ultrasound Doppler, and then we may probably get something ahead of the tumor markers at this level once we are suspecting. And the ultrasound probably would 
tell us also about the not only kidney ureter bladder but also about the liver and the other organs that we would be able to find it out so this is a part of and even the x-ray chest nowadays even ct scan these are the basic tests that would probably tell us about the extent of the disease that is what we should know that is something which is now there are many classifications and which would probably tell us that how the tumor if it is like primary located to the testes or tumor which has already gone into the retroperitoneum then depending on the node size number of nodes and the size 2225 cm or number of nodes and then depending on the metastasis these are or even the serum tumor markers and that is how you will see that and that is how they are going to basically so if you will see that the pathological staging is more important because that is going to tell us about the possibility of exact tumor not only the originating where it is extending and the most important is another thing is a lymphovascular invasion which is also very important that we should know and whether it is been limited to the testes or it is going to the penetrating the epididymis formatic cord or on the lymphovascular invasion you will be able to see that the location and how it gets different structures that is what we should know as i said in a part <coughs> apart from the testes the next is a regional lymph node which is again very important depending on the load or depending on the size if they may not be if it is less than 1 cm we may not able to appreciate probably in either of the ct scan or mri anywhere and then again similarly the pathological lymph node that is what we will actually like to see what are the size whether they are um, malignant means metastasis is present or not and the third would be the distress and the most important now what has been added is a tumor markers like if ldh or your alpha fetoprotein is less than 1000 the we are going to get this into the prognosis and the variety how that matters so if less than 1000 alpha fetoprotein which is normally less than 10 which is good the s2 is like alpha fetoprotein from 1000 to 10000 and if it is about 10000 then generally it is considered s3 so this is the newer thing what is the serum tumor marker which has been added upon and what is the importance why all these things are important these things are important because the prognosis ultimately what is most important is whenever patient comes to us we should be able to understand that we need to explain to the patient about once we do the complete history clinical examinations and investigations we have to explain to the patient that how does what is the prognosis and what is ultimately how the patient is going to behave so like if it is a non seminomatous good prognosis is generally where the tumor markers are less than like alpha fetoprotein is less than 1000 it is primarily to the testes of the retroperitoneum no non pulmonary any visceral anastomosis ldh is low hcg is also less than 5000 and if it is seminoma which are like probably they would again have a good prognosis now if we go to the intermediate prognosis group that is in non seminomatous the testes or primarily it is in the retroperitoneum the alpha fetoprotein is now ranging up to 10000 and still hcg is 5000 to 50000 and in seminoma again that it has been about 10% of cases that any site like the primary is there no and the, in those cases non pulmonary visceral metastases are there and what is a poor prognosis let's understand and generally the in non seminomatous the 16% patients when we get they are going to get already metastatized like mediastinum they are already in the chest and in the non pulmonary visceral like they could be in the brain they could be in the liver they could be in any organ then the alpha fetoprotein could be about 10000 so this we must be able to explain to patients that these are the like poor prognosis this is a very recent in the eau 2020 they have i think probably divided and you should really know about the eau 2020 or aua 2020 ncc and all the guidelines and practically how that makes a difference now what are the recommendations see i strongly believe and i think we should really try to understand ea guidelines 
are the one of the finest. So if you inform the patient of stage one non seminomatous and management options after orchidectomy, see the first thing you will do the orchidectomy to probably diagnose the tissue diagnosis, you know what that then comes whether it, there is a surveillance is there, if it is like very much localized, and then there could be that you may give an adjuvant BEP one cycle, two cycle, three cycle, and there could be retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. And that options you need to give because if there is a teratoma, no chemotherapy would work. And if there could be something is left out, so probably doing a retro a RPLND, which is a part of the even stage one, that is what they recommended. In patients with probably stage one non seminators offer surveillance. Surveillance you can only offer if patient is going to come regularly for a follow-up. You would be knowing that. And otherwise, many patients in our country where they may not come to for proper follow-up, you need to probably make them understand very well. Second thing is, if there is a like lymphovascular invasions, if patient is not willing to undergo kind of a surveillance and one course of at least spreading deposit like BEP, you must give as an adjuvant treatment. So that even if there is a micrometastasis, your one cycle would have, is proven to be better than it's superior to even RPLND to prevent the recurrence. And these are the strong evidence. We must understand what are the strong evidence and that is what we should understand. Similarly, in stage 1A, like there is a no vascular invasion as a low risk. So in those patients, you can probably offer just surveillance. There is no problem. But as we go ahead, stage 1B, like, and that is where the high risk, where you must give one course of BP surveillance and describe about the advantage and the disadvantage. If there is a, like, if you need to do the RPLND, you must probably do the now sparing. These are going to be the young age patients and for them, the ejaculations and those things are very important and probably you must offer and this RPLND, believe me, are not the routine surgery that would be done at the every center. You must understand that these are if it is done once in a while, may not really offer the nerve sparing or the better results. So we must understand they should be done at a very selected basis. And primary, especially the RPLND should be done in a patient with a teratoma and uh, those kind of malignancy. So this is, I already talked about like low risk, high risk vascular invasion and what do we need to do, whether adjuvant chemotherapy, RPLND or the surveillance. So these guidelines we already talked. Now if we go or increase the stage like 2A with marker positive, we should give once tumor markers are like 1000, 5000, 10,000, we must give three cycles of BP. If there is a residual tumor, we must resect that. Similarly in 2A that like no sparing RPLND we already talked about and then in follow up, if there is a mass is there, then again you may add two more cycles of BP. If there is a residual tumor, we must do the RPLND. So these are the very clear cut guidelines. So we are just going according to that. These are the stage two C and three, where probably you must give three cycles of like BP and then depending on the poor prognosis, again, four cycles of BP that you should give. Now the residual mass following the first line of chemotherapy, this is one of the very important thing. Like majority of the people, the BP is still a very standard regime and which probably after four cycles, the majority of the mass and the tumor markers both should come down or may, may, may completely vanish or go off. But if there is a like still the residual tumor like six to ten percent if it is which may contain the active cancers and then if teratoma is there probably adding two more cycles of chemotherapy to this may not help and that is why the rplnd has and many times when you send it for the biopsy even after doing rplnd you may get only necrotic or the fibrotic tissues but at least you can't take a chance so looking at the safety uh, you must do the RPLND depending upon that. If even the additional two cycle does not help. So this is very important of the residual mass. These are the like chemotherapy. We must know the every detail. And I tell you in last workshop, probably when the professor uh, uh, Gunter who came from uh, Europe, 
he said they are giving chemotherapy all on their own and i can tell you since then last two years we have started giving chemotherapy on our own right now the case what we are going to discuss in that gentleman in the all the chemotherapy is given in the ward only and that would really give you the difference that after first chemotherapy what difference second third fourth and how how it has been given the cost also we should know that makes a big difference so you should know how it has been given like this is cisplatin as i said is the most important is given 20 mg all one to five day like for first second third fourth fifth day along with etoposide and bleomycin which is given only on one eight and 15 three days you have to be extremely careful because all pulmonary toxicities are going to happen with this and if this is like salvage after that first line of chemotherapy if still there is a raised tumor markers then probably you may give after the gap of three weeks probably additional chemotherapy that is what you should know now these are the little busy slide but i think the majority of things we have already talked like what are the stage one to a to b to c surveillance where to give three cycles or originally four cycles of chemotherapy if the tumor is left out post chemotherapy management where to do surveillance where to do the residual mass to do rplnd so this is probably the same thing. NCCN is one of the finer place where you can probably understand the disease very well. And this is same way if there is a recurrence, second line of chemotherapy which has been given and that is what uh, you can give either the VIP or even BEIP or T, depending on that. So this is again uh, elevated alpha fetoprotein beta HCG. If it is or somebody has a recurrence, then again you will again start giving false chemotherapy and if mass is there you can probably remove them the third line chemotherapy this is another where you can give the high dose probably chemotherapy and consider cervical society. so these are the few articles like, uh, which are been already this is what is now this is very interesting slide i would say you should know how the testicular tumor or what has really come beta hcg started getting we got first in the urine and then in the desert. 1930 think about that this has been almost 90 years then actinomycin d based chemotherapy and uh, the cisplatin actually tested for testicular tumor in 1970 so which is almost 50 years back and believe me this cisplatin which has been there for 50 years has really now really redeveloped the interest and in that people have started doing uh, we, we are able to see a better kind of the mortality is almost gone to less than 10 percent and that is the real advantage of that the peripheral stem cells transplant uh, and even the largest series of you will see that tiger trial which has been reported and biomarkers and now sparing rpl and dean and so this is the almost timeline which has been there till date and this tiger trial the randomization has been done between the cycle one to four deep are arm A and then in the arm two. And this is one of the game ops trial in which probably they have done uh, the high dose, uh, the uh, gemcitrosamine and that is being given oxy platinum. So now the role of RPLND, as I said, this is again very, very important. RPLND, we should know what kind of no lymph node are we going to remove we are going to like para cable pre cable left and right template and this has been imaging is done again you want to make sure that and how it has been done you must expose the retroperitoneum that is one then this is a one of the split hole technique where you would be on the left to right you will probably start rem removing it and you'll be making sure that you are going to remove all the, and you will like to preserve the nose, the most important. And if required additional kind of a template, depending on the what kind of nodes are involved. The most important is again, the follow-up of the ones you do the tumor mark, and like follow-up tumor markers, X-ray chase if required. Uh, CT scan to make sure that if there is any localized recurrence and this should be done from the year one, two, three, four, five. It is not that which has been done for a short time. 
if there is a like lymphovascular invasion is present, then you must do it more rigorous follow-up because they may have the recurrence. And similarly, the CT scan is one of the most important way that you can pick up that. Now, I think should we go to the case? Is that okay, Dr. Chawla? Uh, you are done with this. We can go with the case. No issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I believe, see, I have not gone in so much detail because theory in textbook or everything is given well. My intention okay. was very clear to give a practical and here we will exactly probably do more discussion because this is a real case. And yeah. I considered for all the residents, the best way to learn urology or like any subject is the day on which you see whichever case, you might have been even seen BPH or maybe bladder tumor, go and read from the Campbell or textbook and the same day, whatever, every day you will probably find out something new. And I consider this is one of the interesting, we, which we actually treated probably a few months back and actually he's coming to us with follow-up. So this is a actual case scenario, which I believe would be more important for you to understand. And so let's go for the case. He was a very young 17 year old gentleman. And just imagine how he had a, some dragging sensation in the scrotum. And uh, so, but this not necessarily one would have the symptoms, understand that. But he also had some upper abdominal pain, dull aching, and then anorexia and loss of weight. Almost 4 kg in one month. No other urinary problems. Then no personal history or no family history of similar kind of, and at this level, everything erection and ejaculations were present. Now on examination, which is most important, otherwise he was completely normal. But when we had put up for abdominal, the liver was palpable. It was absolutely going up to the right iliac muscle. <coughs> and it was absolutely hard in consistency. And the surface was irregular. And this is actually the clinical picture. If you'll see that on the right side, probably the testis is little. And when we palpated it, you will see that it's five by five centimeter. Uh, there was a mass, hard mass, which was there on the right testis. And uh, the lymph nodes were not. What next? Anybody? Can we have the probably uh, people can interact or we want to keep it like only the top? Uh, no, uh, I, I think uh, uh, this time we have kept it a little non interactive. No problem. That's uh, fine. Navneet? Yeah, that Navneet? 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 <coughs> yeah, I don't mind. I, I'll go ahead. I yeah, no. I, yeah, no problem. That's fine. Navneet? So, yes, sir. Uh, Kiran, uh, is anybody who on uh, uh, just a quick notice can volunteer and can be made a video on wants to reply to Dr. Shanik's uh, uh, question? I'll, I'll just write it in the chat box, sir, and people can then join. Okay. Okay, yeah. perfect. No problem. That's fine. Okay. So, I think the next we got the first blood investigations, like the hemoglobin, total counts, and creatinine, and everything was okay. And you will see that majority of urine culture was no growth. What next? The most important is we could find out there was a like testicular tumor, hard mass. The next would be the tumor markers. And if you know that the normal alpha beta protein, just look at this. This is one lakh alpha beta protein. The LDH is also very high. It is 1352 and beta HCG is also. So this is something, this tells us about, this is going to be the, non seminometers okay? The LDH, alpha beta protein, these are the half-life and the normal levels. This you should know. The alpha beta normally is 10 to 20. The half-life is only 24 to 36 hours, while LDH is 5 to 7, and this is variable. So, now in which case the actually increase? This also we should know. Pure embryonic carcinoma and the teratoma, the alpha beta protein would increase, but not in choriocarcinoma or not in even uh, pure seminoma. The HCG would probably more increase in the cases where there is an advance of the pure seminoma. And similarly, the LDH would increase in the cases of where the increase uh, seminoma especially would be there. So let's go ahead. Once we know about tumor markers, we'll get the X-ray chest, which appears to be okay. And then you will see the ultrasound. If you can appreciate that there's some hydronephrosis on the right side, 
and uh, the left kidney is normal <coughs> bladder prostate are okay and <coughs> this uh, hydrophrosis was because of probably which we are going to come next yes if we can see this this is ct scan the, this is liver and which is completely studied with the multiple secondaries and the next plate if you will see that what is most important is there is a large retroperitoneal mass almost which is around both ivc aorta you cannot appreciate both the kidney there is a huge mass and you can probably see that there is a thrombus also if you will see that in the last image in the whole ivc and the, all the branches if you will see that all the arrows are done for the thrombus you will see that so let's look at the report but before that i would say always have a habit of seeing the ct images never go means report is the last thing to be seen before that try to see everything on your own try to see even aorta ivc kidneys ureter the soas the even spleen liver the retroperitoneum try to see every organ on your own and that should be a routine habit just don't think that you will be like to probably see the report then many times i share this because i can tell you we had a one gentleman uh, who was kept for the left radical prostate and whose i remember whose outside report was uh, there was no bony metastasis bone scan was normal but as a habit when we see the bone scan image the plate there were multiple bony metastasis and then we had to explain to the gentleman's relative patient relative and then we had postponed the surgery but then when we asked the radiologist they said actually i was not available somebody else might have reported means whatever may be the reason ultimately we are the treating surgeon and we must know that we can't have a excuse of that that because of this we have done this so and otherwise also this is a good habit to see all the ct scan even mri on our own so this is a like report multiple metastases throughout the both the lobes of liver interaortic cavel paraortic almost 8 by 6 cm huge mass and you will see that tumor thrombus is seen in bilateral common iliac vein extending into the ivc what next so even a char ct was done and there were bilateral multiple pulmonary nodules seen in the what next you will probably actually this was taken the uh, biopsy but i think this uh, from the liver uh, and that was showing the yolk sac tumor predominantly the now the actual the high inguinal orchidectomy which was done and which had really given us the uh, the histopathology is mixed germ cells tumor but most majority of the component was yolk sac tumor and the teratoma was 5% and tumor was already invading the ready testes with lvi invasions so this was pathological pt2 nx m1 the diagnosis was already uh, non seminomatous and now you will see that n3 because all the typical and m1 and even bs3 you will see that because the tumor markers are 1 lakh the alpha beta protein and that is why this is 3c now let us see what so after that uh, the four cycles of bp were given again as i said this bp we only had given so after you will see that the first cycle look at the difference because the patient is with you i is coming back to you after every 21 days and you will be checking the patient so after the first cycle from 1 lakh the alpha beta protein went to 19000 after second cycle went to almost 2000 ldh and you will see that and the follow up after four cycles there was no hepatomegaly patient drastically his appetite his uh, weight gain has happened and his face his face and he uh, he is a 17 year old boy he was completely feeling much better but then after four weeks when we repeated the alpha beta protein was still 1000 it is far better it is 1% of his original report of like 1 lakh but still it was 1000 beta hcg1 so now what next which is still there if you see that the aorta is seen very well and there is a the mass which is encasing the ivc in the liver also you will see the earlier image if you recollect there were multiple like uh, uh, metastases were present but now there are very few very tiny are left out the liver also has got cleared so in this kind of a scenario 
I think uh, probably what we will do is with the probably two more cycles of uh, chemotherapy is being planned. And now this is at this level. We haven't yet probably done. We are planning for that. Now the plan will be very clear. If there is a still like uh, some uh, mass will be left out, that would be the time depending on the size. We will decide and then uh, if required, we may have to do the RPLND provided everywhere else, lung, liver and everything is cleared and his tumor markers are normal. So if it is only localized things are left out, then we should probably remove uh, the mass. That is a so far plan. And that is what this is the actual case which we are treating. So I thought, let me share with you. So I think this is fine from our perspective, Dr. Chawla. Absolutely fine. Um, I just look at the chat section. Uh, if there yeah. is any, any question. Um, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Now, this is a question from Suhail. I think it's quite theoretical. He wants to know about uh, EAU 2020 guidelines uh, for difference between good prognosis and intermediate prognosis, seminoma. Uh, Suhail, today Dr. Shanning has covered NSCCT. Uh, seminoma class is pending. Dr. Shanning, would you like to take this question or shall we keep it for the next class? See, it is fine, but I think he's, to his point, I can definitely uh, answer uh, to that. See, seminoma overall has a good prognosis. Let us understand that, Suhail, because seminoma would, uh, but where, where it matters is a non-seminoma, and especially if you are like going to see like this gentleman who had a, like almost the alpha fetoprotein was one leg, there are metastases where in the liver and everywhere you will see that lung. So you have to, that is why the, uh, in the recent uh, guidelines, they have not only covered with this prognosis, which can really tell us in what direction we are going to go. So if you will see that we would have come in the poor prognosis for this gentleman, which we have shared, but fortunately uh, we have got a good result. And that is how you have to make sure about that in which Rather category comes. Uh, Dr. Shanning, can you hear me? There's one more question. Yeah. Uh, what is the gap between the two cycles of chemo uh, and what is your uh, preferred schedule to repeat tumor markers uh, when the patient is on chemo? See, the first chemo, once we start, as we already, that is why I shown the schedule, it's a 21 day. And then basically we repeat uh, the second cycle. Then we give uh, one second cycle. Every time before starting, also we see the LFTs, we see the CBCs. And patient comes, one cycle is getting over. And then second cycle, we are going to see patient clinically, how is the patient is able to accept, there are no other problems. And then third cycle after 21 days. So we generally finish four cycles almost every 21 days. And once four cycle, or maybe if patient is not, then maybe at monthly interval also, from 21 days, we can make it 28 days also. But at least four cycles, once they are given, then we have kept a break of two weeks which can be up to four weeks. And then we got all kinds of the tumor markers and the CT scan, which we had just shown. Uh, Dr. Shanik, for my curiosity, uh, yeah. what is the follow-up of this patient who has a multiple metastasis in the liver and is showing a very good uh, resolution of metastatic lesion? In that, the... is what I ask you, that is what we have shown from one lakh. He's uh, currently, I think he came probably three days back. His alpha beta protein has gone to 1,000. He's uh, the multiple liver metastasis almost vanished. He's uh, the, uh, the large retrobridal mass has become now a smaller mass, but it is still there. And that is why we are going to give another two chemotherapy. And then we are going to again review the same thing. And that what happens the, with the tumor marker and the mass. That is our next plan. So this is actually a current case which we are treating actually. And that is what I thought is worth sharing with that. Yeah, Dr. Rajiv Sooth, do you have any suggestions? Dr. Shanik, one more thing which I found very interesting is your suggestion uh, that chemotherapy should be given by us. Uh, yes. Exactly, this is a problem which we face when this case goes to tumor board and uh, we don't know what happens to these patients. Uh, there are situations where we don't and, know and, and, how and, and, the while of chemotherapy looks, uh, what is the dose uh, and uh, we, we forget how it is given. And only when the patient comes for repeat imaging and all that, then they bump into back to our urology OPD and then only we realize, oh, this was our patient, but now he's being uh, 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 followed by medical oncology for all 
chemotherapy and post chemotherapy setting but it's a very good suggestion uh, that is a very quick way of learning all the chemotherapy drugs uh, how to uh, parenterally even, even for the prostate cancer we are giving the chemotherapy even uh, the docetaxel or hormonal treatment we are giving on our own and even for the rcc the recent immunotherapy also we are giving on our own so i can tell you majority and looking at this gentleman like the see this is how we probably learn and get uh, uh, knowledge from others these two gentlemen who came from europe or rather the uh, france they said no we give all chemotherapy on our own and that suggestion we really liked and since then we have started giving everyone on our, our own and that is how we were better in touch every after every cycle what is what happens to that uh, is clinical stage and that we can better appreciate or even the side effects will better able to appreciate so uh, no but my question to you is supposing a um, person goes into toxicity and you need a help of uh, then allied uh, um, uh, the other uh, consults so then how you manage uh, do they do they and, agree for seeing the patient or uh... yeah see at a institute we do not have a problem they will definitely see but fortunately i would say for this gentleman like testicular uh, chemotherapy or even bladder or even prostate yet we do not have a really required a need to probably should go and show to somebody else I we mean, had similarly the gentleman who had a multiple bony metastasis and multiple visceral metastasis in CA prostate. We started with docetaxel and everything on our own. So I think probably our yes, our own mindset we need to change. And once we will start probably giving maybe at the institute level in the beginning may not be straightforward. But I think that's a way that uh, we can probably learn better how the chemotherapy no. and everything is to be done. No, Doctor, again, I, I think Doctor Shani. Ah. Yeah, Doctor Sud, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doctor Arun, uh, uh, try to call me. Yeah, uh, yes, no. I, I, I called you just because we were finishing. I wanted you to give the closing remarks. But uh, one, one discussion is going on between uh, me and Shrinik okay. and Rajin sir. Yeah, so yeah, the I, question I, I, here I, I, is, the, uh, uh, Doctor Rajiv, the question was um, the institution of uh, chemotherapy drugs. At some point, we used to give. Uh, but uh, Dr. Shanik has suggested that uh, this is also a, a good idea, so that uh, the people are aware of uh, the doses, the adverse factor, and they they closely follow up the resolution. Uh, they see the improvement with their own eyes, and they can better plan uh, the uh, further treatement. So I, I fully uh, what agree. I, Dr. What Dr. I remember is uh, two weeks back we had a similar scenario when we Dr. Nish was taking class. The, the question here is uh, the most of the tumor board are being now um, uh, taken care by medical oncology unless and until the urology uh, as a urologist you take a pole position or a lead position it will be very difficult most of the malignancies are being just uh, uh, managed by medical oncology somewhere uh, we have to just uh, uh, get our knowledge right get our evidences right and and try to position ourselves in the pole position lead position and lead the tumor board then that will be better i think dr shanik has given a good so, idea dr dr rajiv what your opinion wonderful idea uh, i'll i'll only add that uh, let us have one webinar on uh, uh, this that uh, chemotherapy or the uh, or, or whatever immunotherapy and all the treatment has come it is more relevant for urologists um uh, by urologist himself because there is a trend in in the in us mostly it is not given by urologist but in europe many countries in in the, uh, the trials also they are participating as the investigators as far as delhi is concerned in the two major hospitals like my hospital and uh, saptajang hospital anup is there we are the chairman of uh, tumor board and uh, mm -hmm. we are giving our chemotherapy our uh, ourselves but in uh, other private hospitals the medical oncologists they are not allowing that chemotherapy to be given by the urologists and they are creating problems so we we should uniformly there was a uh, sim uh, symposia in our international conferences also in europe also that uh, who should give the chemotherapy now it is not only chemotherapy it is target therapy it is immunotherapy it is uh, uh, hormone therapy for prostate and all so therefore all these therapies in the individualized treatment 
we should go for individual uh, in, individualize the monitor also in the multidisciplinary we can take the advice whenever required but uh, the lead should be in the hands of uh, urologist this is what we had been advocating and i think this should be um, this there uh, we need a webinar on this yeah let us sir. plan yes sir, yes sir. Uh, and dr shanik i'll take one more question this is from shashank i think yeah. uh, partially you have answered uh, his uh, he is talking about the same case which we have discussed he is seeking after after chemo the tumor marker become normal uh, you have shown the downward trend his question is if this becomes normal and you have a residual mass in retroperitoneum and mediastinum can we go for a section or continue with a second line chemo second line see if there are multiple then we would like mediastinum is also there or could be then i think it is better to go for second line chemotherapy and i think because it is still a systemic disease it is not a localized disease if it is only a retroperitoneal mass rest everything is gone tumor marker have become normal then i think we may think of to resect it off so i think there the second line chemotherapy and he is already responding excellent so i think it is worth probably trying a second line of chemotherapy um would you like to uh, take this question uh, that you want to take uh, uh, the size into consideration and that what should be the mediastinal mass or irrespective of uh, the tumor markers being uh, normal if there is retro uh, retroperitoneal mediastinal we should go for second line that's what you mean am i right yeah yeah i believe yeah. if there are multiple places then i think it is not uh, there is no meaning of going individually <laughs> Uh, and removing it this is a systemic disease probably chemotherapy which already one cycle has means first four cycle has already responded i considered giving a second line of chemotherapy if patient is tolerating well would be a better option and if there is a still left out after second line then definitely and if it is resectable the best way to go is to do the resection of that uh, i think uh, uh, shishank Uh, your question has been well answered by dr shanik uh, and dr shanik there's no more question i think uh, uh, the subject is become little more clear to them with a few doubts they have cleared um, uh, now with this i think uh, uh, we'll uh, uh, go to dr rajiv sooth for uh, closing remarks and we'll sign off uh, after his sure. closing remarks over to you sir uh thank you dr shanik thank you dr arun chavla this was a wonderful uh, webinar in the series and it is going to be archived for the benefit of the students i have told you in the beginning that we are uh, um, developing the uniform we are in the process of developing the uniform curriculum for the urologists uh, indian urology and uh, with this it was discussed once in the ministry of health and family welfare and it was decided that these initiatives co should come from the academic association but the recognition has not come and uh, with the, this uh, implementation of national medical commission this is the right time that uh, we are we, once we complete our one year of these webinars and uh, um, distant learning it is given us the opportunity for uniform curriculum so and uh, the the euro oncology where this today's topic is also uh, belongs to our uh, you, that subsection of uh, uh, sub specialty section of uh, indian urology that is uh, enriched by this uh, very uh, interactive uh, lecture today uh, by dr shranik and we we are looking for more programs next program is on vascular access and uh, dr vikas jain is going to uh, be the convener and uh, we are looking for this opportunity this bad time covid time as an opportunity for uh, streamlining uniform formal uh, uniform um, educational system and also upgrading our skills uniformly across the um, all um, uh, strata like residents to faculty even the teaching all should be uniform your curriculum should be uniform it was wonderful uh, day wonderful evening today and uh, congratulations to all of us thank you
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shainik, once again for uh, excellent coverage of uh, this topic, which is very important uh, for all of the residents. Um, uh, and uh, thanks to all the uh, residents who are at this point uh, uh, locked into our program. Uh, thanks to Namneet and uh, Kiran uh, for their logistic support. And uh, thank you, Dr. Rajiv Sudh. He's in Shirinagar. And this is his actually, he's busy. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, on, yeah, he's, he's there uh, live on uh, with this program. Yeah, uh, yeah that, Every, that is his beauty every, and that is his passion. Is there. Dr. Arun, everybody is there. Dr. Salim yes. Wani and Dr. Munir Khan and Dr. <laughs> Kim. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Dr. Arif. So all are okay. there and uh, they are all listening to you, Dr. Shranik, and we are all enriched with your. Uh, Presentations. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for thank the opportunity. Yeah, Bye, sir. Good, good night, Bye. sir. Stay Bye. safe. Stay Bye. well, sir. Good night, Bye. everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Bye, sir.